Experiments this year at the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, demonstrated that collisions that produce antimatter produce equal amounts of matter. This seems like a no-brainer, but it is a problem for physics because it means that we have failed to find any asymmetry in matter-antimatter production that could explain why there is more matter than antimatter in the universe. Why is there any matter at all if in the Big Bang we expect that equal quantities of matter and antimatter were created? It would have all been annihilated long ago, leaving nothing left to form planets, stars, or us. Some physicists argue matter and antimatter did appear in equal amounts, but because of their opposite nature, they were cast in opposite directions in time or in space so that they did not encounter one another or encountered very little. We have absolutely no evidence that this is the case. Others argue that there is a physical asymmetry beyond the standard model of particle physics that constitutes what we know about how matter interacts. We just haven't found it yet. One idea worth pursuing is that there is an asymmetry, but it cannot be observed in local experiments within the universe because it is a feature of the Big Bang. It cannot be reproduced in the lab without creating a new universe. The Big Bang differs from what happens in particle accelerators in that new matter was created at that time, apparently violating the conservation of mass and energy. This isn't as surprising as it may seem. The laws of thermodynamics may not have applied at that time as they do now, because the universe did not have the same symmetries that it does now. Since the early 20th century, when Emmy Noether proved her famous theorem about the relationship between symmetry and conservation, we have known that energy and mass are conserved because of time translation symmetry. Events that take place at one point in time in our universe have the same physical behavior as those that take place at any other time. This means that where we place time's origin is arbitrary. At the time of the Big Bang, however, this was manifestly not the case. If time has a beginning, then events near that beginning will not obey the conservation of energy and mass. Let us suppose, however, that the process by which matter and antimatter are created, as pairs of particles, is the same, however, now as at the beginning of time, except in one key difference. That difference is the size of the loop that the matter-antimatter pair makes from origin to mutual annihilation. Richard Feynman has argued that an electron-positron pair, for example, that appears and then annihilates is simply a single particle traveling forward and backward in time. This is a consequence of the symmetry group relationship between matter and antimatter. If you flip the charge of the electron, it looks like a positron, but if you flip the direction of time and its parity, direction in space, it looks like an electron again. This charge parity time, CPT symmetry, is universal. This interpretation is called the Feynman Stuckelberg point of view. This is why some physicists indeed propose that antimatter could have formed a mirror universe traveling back in time from the Big Bang. What if, however, at the time of the Big Bang, only matter was created for the most part, and no antimatter? The reason is because if you take one of these matter antimatter time loops and you make it larger and larger, so that it is infinitely large, it does not become two universes, one matter and one antimatter. It becomes only one universe of matter. This cannot be seen, however, in ordinary space-time, but only in a special projection onto space-time called stereographic projection. Stereographic projection has been used since ancient times to create flat maps of the insides of spheres. Ancient navigators needed maps of the stars they could carry with them to determine directions. While a small patch of sky, such as a single constellation, could be drawn more or less as is, the entire sky was a more complex problem. The stars appeared as pinpricks of light on the inside of a sphere overhead. If one attempted to draw them on a flat piece of paper as patches of constellations, the angles between stars became distorted. How could one systematically project these onto a flat map so as to preserve angles? Distances between stars, after all, aren't that important for navigation, but the angles definitely are. Ptolemy published his solution in the 2nd century AD classic Planisphere. Islamic navigators later used his ideas to invent the astrolabe, a convenient pocket tool that predated the compass. Stereographic projection has important applications in many areas, including pure mathematics, but the one that interests us here is its application to fermions, such as electrons and positrons. The main distinguishing feature of fermions is that they have a spin of one-half or a multiple of one-half. At this point, I have to get into some of the mathematics. Fermions are governed by the Dirac equation, and it was in deriving this equation that Paul Dirac first predicted the existence of the positron. Dirac derived his equation by starting with the Klein-Gordon equation for scalar bosons, 
particles that have spin zero, and taking the square root of it, breaking the Klein-Gordon into the product of two equations, one of which is the Dirac. Dirac's insight was great intuition, but just a lucky guess. Unfortunately, physicists are now all taught this bit of lore rather than a more sensible way of deriving it. It turns out that you can derive Dirac's equation purely from the concept of stereographic projection. There are more sophisticated methods of which stereographic projection is a special case, but that is too much for our purpose. The reason why is because of the close connection between rotations in a sphere and how the projection of those rotations onto the complex plane below it appear. Indeed, projecting from a sphere onto a complex plane is how we go from representing quantities in physics with real numbers, such as a light ray, and complex numbers, such as a wave. Our interest here, however, is not projections from a sphere onto a complex plane, but onto a real space-time plane. The reason why is that we want to relate particle paths in space-time to paths on the sphere with the expectation that their projection up from the plane to the sphere will reveal something about the relationship between matter and antimatter. In other words, we want to go from a real plane to a real sphere. Let us suppose that the universe is a four-dimensional de-sitter space. This means that it has constant positive scalar curvature. Observations of the accelerating expansion of the universe indicate that this is likely true. The universe has a cosmological constant, and it is positive. You can imagine a de-sitter space as being the surface of a manifold in a higher dimensional flat space, although it need not be. It looks kind of like an hourglass. In this case, time can be in different directions depending on how the universe is sliced. For example, in a closed universe on the left, time is sliced such that space is positively curved. In the middle, it has no curvature, and on the right, it has negative curvature. Einstein's field equations will choose a different slicing depending on the amount of matter you have and the value of the cosmological constant. Our universe appears to correspond to the middle one. A common trick in quantum field theory is to do what is called a wick rotation. Stephen Hawking talked about this a bit in his book A Universe in a Nutshell. Essentially, you substitute imaginary numbers for real numbers in your representation of time. Then, once you have completed your calculation, you switch back to real time, and Viola, you have the answer. This works because of a fascinating property in the mathematics of complex numbers called analytic continuation, the ability to extend functions defined on real numbers to imaginary and imaginary to real, provided you don't encounter any singularities. The Wick rotation allows you to represent de Sitter space with imaginary time, and this turns the space into the surface of a four-sphere. For context, the ordinary sphere is a two-sphere, because its surface is two-dimensional. The Wick rotation is also useful when drawing Feynman diagrams, and this is where we can draw a fascinating connection. A Feynman diagram is a graphical representation of a particle interaction. This interaction can be between real particles or virtual particles, meaning particles that are never measured directly, but whose influence can be detected. Richard Feynman developed the method as an aid to doing the tedious calculations involved in quantum electrodynamics. It was later extended to all particle interactions, and it is still used to compute the results of collisions in particle accelerators. Typically, Feynman diagrams are done on a flat plane, so we remove two of the spatial dimensions. It turns out this isn't a problem, since we can add those dimensions back in when we compute the contribution of the diagram to our measurements. Take the diagram above. Space is up, and time goes from left to right. The gamma represents a photon that breaks apart into an electron and a positron, these come apart and then annihilate forming back into the photon. Feynman interpreted the electron-positron pair, however, as being a single particle traveling in a closed loop in time. The diagram looks the same in imaginary time. Now suppose that we do the same but now on our de-sitter space. The loop on the flat plane becomes a loop on the surface of the sphere. This is not an accident. We call the relationship between the sphere and its stereographic projection conformal. Angles stay the same and if something is a circle on the sphere, it stays a circle in the plane. The only real exception is when a circle has a point passed through the north pole of the sphere. Stereographic projection works by drawing lines from the north pole through the point on the sphere you want to project to the point on the plane where it goes. But what if you want to project the north pole itself? It turns out that this point projects out to the infinite distance, not only in a single direction, but in all directions. In other words, if you took the plane and wrapped it up so it fits onto the surface of the sphere, all the points at infinity, in every direction, would all map to the North Pole. When making maps of the night sky, it is common to use the point that you don't care about as the starting projection point such as the South Pole if you live in the Northern Hemisphere. 
This causes all the points in the northern hemisphere sky to conveniently map inside a circle. This means that, for any matter-antimatter loop in our imaginary time-to-sitter space, no matter how small the loop is, if one point passes through the North Pole, it will look like a straight line in stereographic projection. Needham Tristan, Visual Complex Analysis, Oxford University Press, 1997. Since the surface of the sphere is our representation of de-sitter space-time, we can also place the Big Bang, the origin of time and space, at the North Pole. The South Pole is somewhat arbitrary since in imaginary time, space and time are the same, and the origin is not supposed to be special, but typically we make this our own location in space and time. Besides the Big Bang, the North Pole also represents infinite space and time. While matter-antimatter loops anywhere on the sphere that do not pass through the North Pole will be quite ordinary, loops that do pass through it will be straight lines going from infinite time and space and ending up at infinite time and space. Most importantly, at no point does time reverse for these particles. Now, in our universe, we don't expect particles to just come from infinity. We can't prove that a bunch of matter won't just pass into our observable universe one day, but we don't expect it. We do, however, expect them to come from the Big Bang. Since the Big Bang is at the North Pole, we view matter as coming from it. They still, stereographically, appear to come from infinity, but since they pass through the Big Bang, our ability to determine where they came from before that is hidden. On the sphere, these particles look like they are coming out of the Big Bang and returning to it, just like matter-antimatter loops, but in projection to the plane, they come from negative infinity and pass into positive infinity. I propose that the matter we are familiar with in the universe primarily follows this path and therefore all looks like ordinary matter because it never actually turns back on itself and goes back in time. In essence, the symmetry between matter and antimatter is never broken. Instead, the loop from creation to annihilation has infinite curvature and thus it all looks like matter to us. In that way, the missing antimatter is everywhere because it is just matter.